Okay, I'm Bill Heary. Uh, some of you may know me from my many years uh, in, with big gaps at, at Poly, Brooklyn Poly when I started. Um, I was there as an undergraduate, a graduate student, got a PhD in 67. I was an instructor in the math department for six years. Uh, then I went off and did other things, uh, including a long stint at Bell Labs where I worked on computer, distributed computing systems, full tolerant computing and security. Uh, then I retired from that and moved back to what was then Polytechnic University, then became NYU Polytechnic, and now is NYU Tennis School of Engineering, uh, working part-time as a retiree in the computer science department, mostly doing things related to computer security. Um, so you could have seen me as a, as a student of mine from uh, 67 or 68 to 74, I might have been your student if you've been around for a long time, from 63 to 70, 1970, or you might have had me see me as an instru instructor or a faculty member from, I guess it was 2003 to about 2015. So hopefully some people that know me are here and will enjoy this. And for those of you who aren't, I hope that you'll get a good impression of this and maybe there'll be another one of these sometime in the future. Okay, today's talk um, is called Blockchain, the Useful Technology Behind Cryptocurrencies. And I picked that topic because uh, there's a lot of controversy about cryptocurrencies. Are they really useful? Is it just, you know, oh, is it bogus? Is it just a fad? Uh, but whatever you think of cryptocurrencies, the technology underneath it, the blockchain is really very useful. And I'm gonna talk mostly about blockchain and talk about the currencies only as needed to enhance the discussion. Okay, so. Uh, okay, the background to this talk is that in 2009, someone by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto, who is still unidentified and is thought possibly to be a collection of people, not just a single person, introduced a cryptocurrency co called Bitcoin. And it's not the first attempt to have digital money on a computer. David Chom started working on that in a master's thesis in I think it was 1982 or 1983. <clears throat> but Bitcoin has, is a much more elaborate system and really started catching on after a few years. Uh, a few years after he introduced this, articles in the technical and financial and popular press started appearing talking about blockchains for various kinds of applications. And as I read through those, because it sounded interesting to me, having a mathematical background and the using cryptography, et cetera, sounded very interesting. Uh, I started reading a lot of articles and I read them. This is back going back to uh, you know, the 2015 or so, that era. And it was like, I can't make sense out of this because every article seemed to say something different about what a back blo blockchain was. Uh, some of them were talking, I know now, about the blockchain for Bitcoin, but there's a more generic family of things called, called blockchains. And uh, it was hard to feel what was going on. So I started reading a lot of them and trying to piece together what was the common thread through all of them. Uh, but I noticed in some articles, they would say blockchain does is A, and then they would say it's not A. So I, it was hard to figure this out. And I tried to go to find good references. Um, there was a, a, you know, there was some books. Uh, IBM had a lot of good information on the web, et cetera. So I eventually put together enough information to clear up in my mind what uh, a blockchain was in general and what the different variables are and how they're useful to know about if you do want to do a blockchain uh, application somewhere. Uh, so that's what initiated this talk. I've given a version of this a couple of times in the last few years to different audiences. And every time I find more things to add and update, et cetera. <clears throat> yeah. um, <clears throat> okay, so what I'm gonna do is focus on the block, the properties of the blockchains and the motivation for developing blockchain primarily from Bitcoin, because that was where it came out, came, came from, um, and what the underlying technology is. Uh, Although the cryptocurrencies will be used as part of the motivation, uh, there is something strange happening with my computer lines are showing up on it. I'm not sure why. Hopefully it'll go away with the slide. Uh, okay, it'll be used for describing the methodology. I'll talk a little bit about Bitcoin. The main thing is to talk about uh, what bit blockchain is. 
uh, not talk about what Bitcoins are or any other cryptocurrency. That's about economics and politics, which I don't think I know enough about those topics in this context to talk about. Uh, to some people, it actually seems more like religion. Uh, okay, so the idea then is to figure out what's useful about the blockchain and um, how it can be used. And I don't know how those lines got there, but hopefully they will go, they, well, they can, I don't think they're gonna go away. Okay, so the outline of the talk is just some of the basic properties, not very technical. Uh, and then the next thing is why does Bitcoin need something like blockchain? Why was it only invented basically for, for, black, for, for Bitcoin? Uh, I'll do a, then I wanna do a quick survey of cryptographic concepts for a couple of reasons. One, uh, they are very important to blockchain. A lot of things don't work without crypto, but blockchain really depends on some of the, the various properties of cryptography, particularly public key cryptography. And I think that's an important area. And a lot of people use it every day, but don't understand quite what public key cryptography is. So I'm gonna ex actually explain that. So you'll know when you get the little lock symbol in your browser window, uh, what the technology is that's going behind that. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, how they work in a little more detail, knowing more about uh, having talked about cryptography and how that fits in, et cetera. Uh, it's still not going to be a very deep thing. I'm going to gloss over a lot of details and take some shortcuts on things, but at least you'll get an idea of how the technologies fit together. Then I'll talk about some of the different types of blockchains in the sense of how you can make decisions about how the blockchain is going to be set up for your particular application, because there isn't just one blockchain definition. There's a, a suite of different variables that you could pick in terms of how you want to control things. And then I'll just go over a few uh, applications, the kinds of applications that people are, are looking at or doing. And then we'll have a concluding discussion where I will answer questions then. I prefer not to ask answer questions during the talk. I'd rather do it as we get to the end. At that point, you can raise your hand if you have questions. I will also welcome anyone in the audience who has some experience in uh, developing or starting to develop a blockchain application to come and just say a few words of what they're doing and in particular, what kind of issues they ran into. And I'll be listing several of the things we have to make decisions, what, how they address some of those decisions, like whether it's gonna be centrally controlled, uh, what the consensus mechanism is gonna be, et cetera. Okay, from uh, the original blurb for this, a blockchain is a distributed, secure, full tolerant open, immutable, and verifiable ledger. Okay, it's a lot of words. You might or might not know what all of those mean. I'll explain them and how they fit about, how they fit into this topic. It's based on distributed trust, not a central trust authority. That was the main thing that Bitcoin wanted to do. The, the idea of Bitcoin was to not have a central trust authority for handling all this uh, electronic commerce. They didn't want it to be in the hands of a government, of corporations, et cetera. They want it to be sort of like a peer to peer kind of system where you don't have to worry about trusting any entity. Your trust is all embedded in the software and the other participants. Uh, they wanted, or the developers of, of Bitcoin wanted anonymous users. That's now application specific. In a lot of applications where blockchain is very useful, you might wanna have uh, not anonymous users if you're doing some kind of a banking application where the government will have to know about the social security number, et cetera, for the people with accounts, that becomes important. Uh, okay, everything that you do um, in blockchain, you could actually do with existing ledger software, okay? Database, other things like that. So this is not gonna enable you to do new things. It enables you to do them in different and better, hopefully better ways. And last, uh, the things that we talk about are not in all the blockchain applications. You will have to uh, you know, decide what, if you're gonna do one, what you need and pick and choose from the possibilities. Uh, I think I already said all of this, so I'll skip this slide. Okay, so let's go back to defining what was in that initial definition. The first thing is what is a ledger system? Well, it's something that your banks, financial institutions, maybe you personally have, and it's basically 
a collection of data sets usually called accounts, but they don't have to be financial, and a process for external inputs called transactions, which may change things. So if you had a banking uh, ledger, it would have a list of all the accounts, and then you would have transactions when people make deposits, withdrawals, et cetera. And then they would, um, when those happen, the change we made right in the in the ledger system. So it's so on a computer, you would just change the value. Uh, brokerage has the same thing, except it gets a little more complex. Voting uh, is a very interesting one to think about as a ledger. There is certainly a ledger in terms of voter registration, et cetera. Uh, and I'll talk a little more about this later. Potentially, there would be a ledger that shows who voted and what who they voted for, but that gets very tricky because you can't associate an individual with their vote. Uh, other places where we'll talk about possible applications that exist now, um, air, airline and maintenance records. Uh, there's, or, uh, th there's a lot of parts to an air, airplane and uh, it's a very tricky problem to keep track of all the parts, when things have to be changed, et cetera. Uh, and that's a very important application that's done now with standard software. And it's a case where blockchain might actually make it much more interesting. And the last thing which drove it all, of course, is the ownership and transition of uh, transactions with cryptocurrencies. Okay, in a traditional ledger, the updates really happen in place. Uh, because they happen in place, you, could, you only can see this current state. What you probably wanna do is have periodic backups made so you can look at the state at different places, different time, and even a record of the transactions backed up so that you could reconstruct the state of the ledger uh, as you need to, uh, if there are any problems. Okay, you will see that in a blockchain, all this is immediately part of it. You have you have a complete record of all the transactions, all the states, et cetera, at various times. Okay, so what is blockchain then? It's a sequence of states, which are called blocks of the combination of the ledger, the new transa transactions, and other information, depending on what your application says basically the whole state of what's going on at some point in time. Uh, and you save that in such a way that you can then use it next time, but then you, um, every time you do this, you save, you get a new block. Um, these lines are driving me crazy, these red lines. I assume everybody else sees the red lines too. Uh, okay. Uh, wait, sorry to interrupt. Um, if Luis Schultzler, could please remove the red lines. Um, he made the annotations by accident. Uh, that would be great. Sorry to interrupt you, Bill. Okay, that, that's good, because I don't know how I made them. Anyway, um, okay, so you get a set of transactions, they process them, uh, and they're saved. And then what you do is you have a fingerprint, which I'll explain more later, about each state that it's in, that gets put into the next next state. So every you know, set of, let's say, N transactions, you update everything and you keep carrying along as fingerprints that you can always see if there's been a change made. Uh, and that's the key point that if there's been a change made anywhere in the sequence of events, and I'll have a, a diagram in a minute, uh, because of this fingerprint, you will know the fingerprint is then wrong if you try to change something. If somebody tries to change uh, their balance at some point in the account, uh, that will change the fingerprint and the fingerprint will no longer match what it should be. That's the basic idea of immutable immutability. Um, and because of these uh, fingerprints, uh, the fingerprints can be computed by anybody in the public that sees the data. So you can always check to see if the fingerprint is right or if somebody's changed something, therefore the fingerprint is wrong and there's some attempted fraud or something like that. Um, Okay, so here's a picture of uh, this. <clears throat> Each of the, the three rectangles is the state at next some point in time and it goes through time. So you start with the ledger with some state. These are the entries in the ledger. Uh, there's a timestamp, uh, transactions have occurred, uh, and there's what I call the footprint and this for this block. Okay, so that's where you're starting off at maybe time zero. In this case, it's time n. What you then go to is you'll start collecting transactions. You don't process them one at a time. It turns out to be much more efficient to do a, blo a block of transa transactions at once. 
and you have to have an update process, which means that the transactions all go into this update process, but they're considered part of the next state. So the next state will wind up having the what's in this ledger after the transactions, but the transactions are part of considered part of this state. And I'll explain why in a minute. Okay, so the transactions will go to some kind of an update process, which then takes the old ledger, the, the fingerprint of the old ledger, combines it with the transactions, creates the updated ledger and a new fi fingerprint. Because this fingerprint is made from all the things that were back here, it essentially includes a piece of what the fingerprint was before. So the new fingerprint actually has some residual information for the first one. And it turns out that if you change something here, the way we're gonna be doing, it has to be changed here. So this is what enables you to have a chain of things where you can verify that nothing improper has happened in the past. Okay, so, um, and the next transaction, you know, this now is, is saved, it has, has its own fingerprint. Next set of transactions, so you do the same thing with the update process, use the transactions, the prior state, the prior timestamp, the prior fingerprint, and you construct a new one. So that's basically what's going on. Now, one of the other uh, things that was mentioned at the beginning is that it was distributed. And in fact, it will be distributed. There will be multiple chains like this, all together being the blockchain, but it's, there's multiple chains and they're replicated on different nodes or servers. And you can have as many of them <clears throat> as you want. And you'll see that for things like uh, Bitcoin, there are gonna be a lot of these chains because everybody wants to get in and do things with it. And anybody can actually come in and be a node that also has their own copy of the chain. But the chains have to be identical. And that's another way that you can verify things. If there's, there's something is different in the fingerprint of something, something went wrong somewhere. Okay, so I mentioned the, the consensus protocol, which is actually, well, that's the update process is also called the consensus protocol. That is something which uh, is actually a task that is done by multiple nodes working together. It's not necessarily all the nodes, but there, there will be a set of nodes which will participate in this consensus protocol uh, to see what the next block should be. Okay, it's software that's on every server and includes all the communications, all the other servers, et cetera. And depending on the application, the consensus protocol can be very different. And that's gonna be one of the big differences between different application areas. And just to give you a, a little bit more of a flavor of what's going on, the consensus protocol in the middle is actually a distributed process on all of the nodes that are, that are participating in the consensus. It could be all the nodes, it could just be selected nodes. It could be one node, node in a, a tightly controlled blockchain that is just run by one organization. In Bitcoin, the consensus protocol is done by all the nodes that are all independent and participating in blockchain. They will be the places uh, where people are creating uh, new block, new uh, Bitcoins, et cetera. And the way it works from a different perspective, not the time perspective, is you have users that submit uh, transactions. Typically, they'll, trans they'll submit it to one of the servers that, or one of the nodes which they're connected to, and then it gets distributed to all of the nodes. So the transactions wind up in all the nodes and the consensus pro protocol is using all of them. And then it will, as in the picture before, it will take the last state, combine it with the new transactions, uh, including generating the fingerprints, et cetera. Uh, so you know, the, pri oh, the prior block goes into this and then if it does the updating, and this consensus agrees on what the updated block should be, all of the nodes get the same updated block. So it's an, another view of what's going on. Okay, so it'll have, uh, they'll agree on what the next block is supposed to be. Uh, it should have all the transactions in it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so at, at the end, you have all of the nodes have uh, a copy of the same block N or N plus one, depending on when you started counting. Okay, it's secure. Security is often considered to be the combination of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, 
all of these are covered by this. So confidentiality is what you normally think of as privacy or secrecy. Uh, only the ones who are supposed to see the data can see the data. Integrity means that only, only the entities that can change the data and are allowed to change it uh, actually can change it. And availability means that it's always there when you need it. Uh, and we'll look at these in more detail in the context of blockchains in a few minutes. But security uh, is very strong in blockchains because everything is based upon strong cryptographic mathematical methods. And we'll describe them in more detail, but it includes encryption, it includes authentication, it includes digital signature, it includes secure hashing. All these are mathematical things that are cryptographic methods, and they're all important in building a blockchain. And that's uh, one of the main points about the security. But just an aside about something that applies to anything you develop, uh, not special about bl uh, blockchains, is that there can be bugs in the software. You know all about that. Uh, it's only part of a bigger system with users who might be subject to phishing attacks, et cetera. So the security of the whole system depends on the software in the system, including the consensus protocol, which may have flaws. And um, it also depends on you know, all the standard security measures, plus there's extra issues that you have because you've got uh, all these things floating around in multiple copies, et cetera. Uh, and just a side comment that when you have identical software running on a lot of servers, security reliability is a little bit of a risk because if somebody finds a flaw in one of the, in the software, they can attack all of the, all the servers or the nodes at the same time and wreak havoc. So you really have to be careful about the security in the software you develop and the software you're using. The users themselves also have secrets to have to worry about, which is outside of the blockchain. They will have uh, some credentials typically involved with uh, public key encryption to log in and make a transaction. Uh, they have to protect that key. If you have a lot, let's say, if you're doing crypto country, cryptocurrencies, if you have a lot of money in cryptocurrency and it's on a server um, and you have the pass, you have the only password, you have to make sure nobody steals that password. So you have to make sure it's very well protected. Typically people that are doing things, again, with Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, even though we're talking about blockchain in, in general, uh, they will often have their keys uh, offline. They will have it in a separate box, a separate device that they only go to when they actually wanna make a transaction. Also, they have to make sure they don't lose it. Uh, if you lose your key, there's no way of recovering it unless you've set up something in advance to uh, recover it. Uh, you might have heard of a case recently of somebody, I think it was in the UK, who lost the, the, cert, the only disk drive that had his key, accidentally threw it away, and is trying to get the, ta the town where, this, where it is, where the dump is, to get permission to go through everything in the dump to try to find that uh, hard disk. And they're saying, no, environmentally, it's not a good idea. I don't know how that's going to resolve. So you certainly have to take all the standard precautions. And for that key, you really have to take a lot of precautions because unless you set something up in advance to have some kind of a backup, if you lose it, you, lose, you lost everything. OK, it's going to be full tolerant. Uh, that's not a new concept. Typically, full tolerant systems have multiple processes running in parallel. Uh, they have ways of just you know, checkpointing things to decide which is the right answer at any point, et cetera. Uh, blockchain also achieves full tolerance by having replicated things. Uh, and the consensus protocols should make sure that all the uh, servers have the same information. But again, it's identical software, and that's always a risk you have to worry about. Okay, it's open. Okay, this really only applies to some of the blockchains that are used for cryptocurrencies, where the idea is everybody wants to be able to see everything. Uh, and the idea is that all of the transactions uh, and even what is, what is owned by different people that will not be identified with who they are, but will just be some uh, ID they make up, uh, all of that is open for anybody to see. And because they can see it, they can monitor all the transactions and they can verify all the fingerprints. Those fingerprints are key. If somebody changes something, that fingerprint would change. So you want to have them, anyone see the all, all of the data so that they can verify the, the fingerprints. And the identifier is the same as an, an account number. Uh, so a person might have multiple identifiers even within one blockchain. 
think of somebody with a lot of Swiss bank accounts, same person, uh, no name connected to the, the account under the old rule. Switzerland now has been forced to crack down on that. Uh, so some blockchains though are called permission blockchains. We'll talk more in detail about those in a few minutes. Uh, and only permissioned entities can see the blocks. So you might have something where you wanna keep information con confidential. You can't do that on uh, Bitcoin blockchain, but you can do it on blockchains for special purpose that you want. So you can keep the information private. Maybe if it's a banking application, just open it up so the auditors can see all the, the information, uh, but not everybody can see. So I can't see what's in your account that you just made a deposit, but the auditors can check all that stuff. Uh, so that can happen in banking and other financial things. And in fact, most commercial applications wind up being permission blockchains. Uh, verifiable, that's because the transactions are all recorded and the, uh, the fingerprints carry through things. You can, you can verify that the fingerprint is correct and you know nothing has changed. And immutable is really almost the same thing. Uh, somebody can change it. You can't go back and say, hey, six months ago, I made this deposit and put it in the blockchain. Because if you did, it would change the fingerprint from that blockchain or from that block rather, which would then change the fingerprint from the next block, et cetera, all the way through. And by verifying the, the fingerprints, you can see that something was changed because the fingerprint won't be correct. And it's distributed trust, which we'll talk about more that's related to the consensus algorithm. Okay, um, the original blockchain of uh, Bitcoin wanted to have an anonymous users and that's still the way it's structured. Uh, so on you know, a lot of blockchains, particularly ones involving cryptocurrency, uh, you just have an identifier, which is an account number. You don't have anything further about you. You don't have your name, your social security number, et cetera. And that was very important to the developers of the original blockchain. <clears throat> uh, but in some cases in real world applications, you need to have those connections made. So uh, that then becomes an optional feature depending on how you build your blockchain application. And uh, the interesting thing is that even though for blockchain, everything is supposed to be anonymous, uh, the FBI in the US and other ages have been able to identify some users through monitoring traffic to and from the blockchain nodes and through networks. Uh, they wanna do that because a lot of the transactions on uh, some of the cryptocurrency uh, websites or not websites, blockchains are illegal transactions. They might be purchases of drugs, which would be very popular when blockchain first came out or when Bitcoin first came out. Uh, right now, if you've heard of ransomware, uh, the ransom is typically paid in uh, Bitcoin or some other uh, cryptocurrency. But by monitoring some traffic, uh, even though I don't know quite how, uh, the FBI recently has been able to identify who got uh, a lot of uh, money from ransomware, a lot of the ransoms, and was able to get it and return it to the original people. Uh, the FBI is not saying just how they do that. Uh, I can, I have some guesses, but the idea basically is they monitor the networks and maybe they know certain uh, webs, certain locations are owned by somebody from other information. They combine information from different sources. Uh, they try to follow a transaction uh, and see whether there's multiple links. You, know, you might you not just connect uh, from your account to the blockchain, but you connect through six different servers. And so they've got to trace you back to all those six different servers. Uh, there's mechanisms that apparently they can use uh, to do that. Uh, Okay, this just went backwards. Uh, the keys are not working properly. What's going on? Okay, so why do cryptocurrencies need something like Bit Bit blockchain? I've actually said a little bit about that along the way, but uh, the basic question is trust. Uh, the developers of uh, Bitcoin and blockchain were a very libertarian spirit. They did not want to trust anything run by the government or anything the government had access to. They didn't want to tr trust banks, large corporations, et cetera. And I suspect it was partly 
uh, developed that way because it came out right after the financial crisis of, of 2008, when people started being not trusting a lot of things. So instead of trusting some central authority, whether it be a government, a bank, um, a corporation, whatever, uh, the trust is put in the, the people and the organizations and really the software in the system. Uh, and as the software's trust is constructs that it'll be very hard for anybody to break the rules, particularly by having these fingerprints that go all the way through. So if somebody changes something, you can detect it. Uh, uh, now, one of the issues with trusting software is if you're using Microsoft Office, can you trust that? Uh, it has security flaws. Some people don't, wouldn't want to trust that. They can't see into it. Most uh, blockchain applications now are built on top of open source software. So you can potentially go in and look at all the software, but there's a lot of software that you'd have to look at. Uh, the operating system, the libraries, the application software, all those things you implicitly have to trust. And there's no way you can verify everything. You just have to hope that somewhere along the line, somebody is, is checking all this stuff. Okay, trust has always been an important part of money and transactions. And here's a short history over time of uh, how the trust was established. Uh, direct trading, if you think back, you know, 2000 years, when there were 3000 years when there wasn't really any kind of form of currency, you traded with people, you, you traded your corn for somebody's sheep, something like that. And you know, the trust was in the partner that they, the, the, the sheep was really healthy, whatever. And it was one to one, so that was pretty easy to do. Once coins came out, then the, con the consensus trust was in the, the minter of the coin and the value of the metal. They didn't use a diluted silver or a diluted gold. They used the full, uh, full strength, whatever it should be. Uh, so you have to trust in that. Uh, when banks started issuing paper money, the trust was in the bank and the capital behind it. And very often that wasn't very good. And there are periods in history when paper money issued by banks uh, became worthless, particularly after the Civil War, when I think virtually all of the Civil War bank issued uh, currency became useless. So they started putting silver and gold backing behind the government pa issued paper money. So the trust was that the government really had the gold and silver, which could be problematic because gold and silver are rare. And then you wouldn't necessarily have a way to create more currency. Uh, and that was, a, that was a major political problem in the late 1800s, early 1900s. You've probably heard of uh, William Jennings Bryan's famous speech about the cross of gold uh, and when he was running for president. He was saying, we, you have to get rid of gold as the backing. Uh, eventually we switched to non-backed paper currency. Then you basically remain, trust that the government is going to have policies that maintain the value. And you know, in the US, the government may, does a lot to try to maintain that value. In some countries, it's almost impossible. You think of countries where they have inflation of 100% a month and things like that. So uh, that's always tricky. Uh, if you're putting money in a bank account, then you're trusting the bank and that it has the assets that it claims it has. Um, and what assets they have to have is controlled by federal regulations. And then there's the FDIC that backs them up. If they do screw up and go bankrupt, uh, you get your money back within you know, certain constraints. Uh, similar thing with brokerage accounts. So the idea of trust has always been around. This is just gonna be a new trust model. Okay, cryptocurrency is just a ledger entry. So there's this crypt, bit, uh, blockchain and somewhere there's a ledger entry that says, uh, Bill Heary has 17 Bitcoins. Okay, the Bitcoin itself has no intrinsic value. It's, just, it's a ledger entry, that's all it is. So what you need uh, basically is some trustworthy uh, form of proof of ownership. And that's, where the, that's what the blockchain is. It's hopefully a trustworthy proof of ownership system. Uh, so blockchain does that for Bitcoin. There are a lot of other blockchains that do, it for, I think there's several hundred different cryptocurrencies now. Uh, so uh, that's the way they all work. But it is really just, uh, you, you trust the system and that's what you're trusting. And there are some people who don't trust the system, especially when they see the values go up and down. And there was one recently that went virtually to zero. Uh, so the, coin, the cryptocurrency is an interesting topic that I, as I won't really get into. I'm mostly interested in technology. Um, 
Bitcoin and blockchain are based on public key cryptography. Uh, that's where the name crypto comes. And as an aside, in my personal opinion, uh, the term crypto used to mean anything related to cryptography. It's been taken over by the, what we now would call the crypto community, where it now means anything related to blockchain and NFTs and things like that. Uh, and it's gotten away from the original use of the word. And people that work in cryptography aren't happy about that, but there's nothing can we do about it. Okay, so anonymity is not necessarily part of all blockchains because if you're doing a banking application, you will have to be able to provide information to the government. Just checking my time. Uh, oh. Okay. Um, okay, so we need the notion of uh, ownership that and a means of proof of ownership. In Bitcoin, that's based on public key cryptography, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and it's also based on the consensus system, which we'll go into more detail about. And we wind up with a distributed, secure, fault tolerant, open, mutable, uh, un immutable, verifiable uh, ledger with anonymous access for Bitcoin and other currencies, but not for everything. Okay, but all these systems have it based on strong cryptography. Now, what's supposed to be good about, the, uh, about using this method? One, they claim it eliminates middlemen. There's no fees to banks, credit card processing transaction costs, et cetera. No taxes. Oh, that's great. This is all hidden from the government. Uh, but what wound up happening was because, of, especially the last thing, uh, it was used a lot for illicit purpose and still is. At some point earlier in the uh, history of, of Bitcoin, something like 80 or 90% of all the transactions were traced to doing things related to drug purchases or weapons purchases. Reportedly, there are even been people who uh, got contracts to assassinate people uh, paid in Bitcoin. I'm not sure if that really happened. Uh, uh, now it's being used for ransom, supposedly for, for uh, trafficking of people. Uh, it's also used for money laundering, which is illegal in the US. That's something that's looked out for carefully. Okay, so uh, it looks like, uh, you know, it should be free though. There's no transaction fees, no processing fees, et cetera. <clears throat> Turns out that it's not free because you've got a huge infrastructure of nodes, uh, software development, et cetera, with the cryptocurrencies. Uh, that costs a lot of money to run and it costs a lot of money to develop the software, et cetera. Where does the money come from? Uh, in Bitcoin, nodes quote, mine Bitcoin by working on consensus protocol. They basically do what's called a proof of work approach where you prove that you have done a lot of computational things that require a lot of energy and computing resources. And then uh, you don't get money just from doing that. What you get, you get money basically if you successfully in mining something before somebody else does and you get paid in Bitcoin. And right now I think it's like six and a quarter Bitcoin for each time you are successful in, in mining and mining some more stuff. So you get that into your Bitcoin account. Uh, but then as with anything, if there's more of it around, it basically will degrade, devalue it over time. So there's, there's some, that's one way you pay. The second way is that in reality, if you wanna do anything with Bitcoin, like uh, buy Bitcoin with money or use Bitcoin to, convert it to money or switch from one Bitcoin of uh, one Bitcoin from Bitcoin, let's say, to a different cryptocurrencies. Pardon me if I keep saying Bitcoin for cryptocurrency in general, I tend to slip and do that. Uh, if you do that, it turns out that the uh, platforms that let you do that, uh, like Coinbase is one that basically is a, a platform for doing crypto transactions, they do charge money for that. Um, so it's not free after all. And I'll close this introductory section with what I consider to be a very early version of Bitcoin. Uh, this is actually a pre-Columbian Inca uh, thing that was used for keeping accounts. This is for a photograph of something that's on display in a uh, museum in Santiago, Chile. And they haven't figured out, the archeologists haven't figured out exactly how it works, but they have determined that each of those uh, lines coming out from the, the center chain is some kind of an account and the little blurbs on it are 
account mechanisms and new transactions or something like that. They haven't figured out how it works, but they, they do think it is basically the equivalent of Bitcoin. Uh, so the, the Incas were ahead of us. Okay, cryptography. Okay, basically encryption is just a method of describing a message called the plain text, abbreviated P, into another uh, message called the ciphertext C using mathematical algorithms. So its meaning cannot be understood by someone who only sees C. <clears throat> the encryption is transforming uh, C back into P. Modern cryptography uses mathematical algorithms, a mathematical function, and the key for encryption and decryption. So you have to know both the algorithm and the key, which is gonna be hopefully very hard to find in order to do encryption. Uh, they're designed for confidentiality, but can also be used for things like authentication, digital signature. Uh, and there's an excellent book called the, the Code Book, which is actually 20 odd years old, but it's still a very good book. Uh, I don't know if you can see if my window is big enough to see. Uh, uh, it, it's in the references. Um, it's not a thorough history of cryptography, but it's a, a walk through cryptography uh, and how it fit into history. Uh, things, how the messages for Queen Victoria, uh, Queen Mary were intercepted by Queen Victoria's people and they decrypted them and that gave her enough information to uh, hang uh, or, or decapitate uh, Queen Mary, as I recall. Uh, so he's got a lot of examples where it's used in history, but also explains exactly what the cryptography was in each one. And it goes up to current day with public key cryptography. It did a lot, does a lot on uh, the enigma, et cetera. So it's, it's, a, it's a very good book. It's, it's a very fun read. And you learn a lot about how the cryptography actually works. Okay, let's look at some very simple cryptographies. I won't spend much time on it. Uh, the simplest one is called the Caesar cycle, where you can see I've got two circles of letters. Um, in order. And basically the key is how many rotations to the left or right you go. So, uh, uh, and basically you probably play with this as a kid. Uh, you know, you can add one, add two, add seven, and as long as there's an alphabet in front of you, you can encrypt and decrypt with the same key. Uh, and in this case is actually the two ring, so you can move one to the, the, up, the right place and the other one. So if your key is, and I didn't check the number, I don't know, Q is maybe the 15th letter of the alphabet. So the key is 15, you can set A to Q, and then B goes to R, and you can just go through all these. Uh, and the famous example of that, which is uh, said to be false by the people that did it, is that in the movie 2001, the computer HAL is actually IBM, which was the primary computer company in those days, uh, encrypted with the code of one. Arthur Clark denies that was the reason. It was just something he picked up for whatever reason. You can accept that or not. Okay, most crypto algorithms, in fact, all crypto algorithms until the 1970s were all called symmetric. The same key is used to encrypt and decrypt. So Cypher, uh, Caesar, uh, Caesar Cypher is one of those. The German Enigma machine um, is one of those. Much more complex, obviously. Uh, in the 1980s, the data encryption standard was picked in the United States by the US government to be required for certain kinds of financial transactions, certain kinds of transactions with the US government. Because of that, it became a standard everywhere uh, as an accepted a well, well, a well vetted algorithm. Uh, that's since been replaced by, uh, well, the NSA had one that was called Skipjack, but DES has been accept, replaced by AES Advanced Encryption Standard, which has a 256-bit key uh, and is considered very strong. The key thing about this, these historic methods of encryption, uh, the symmetric encryption, is that both parties have to know what the key is. So if I'm doing sending an email to you and I want to encrypt part of it and I want to I have a certain key, I have to somehow get the key to you. And that's been the problem with uh, encryption systems uh, for, for hundreds of years, uh, the, the key management problem, how do you get the keys to the people that need them? Uh, there are elaborate schemes like within the military, they will have code books that have to be distributed to different locations that will have what the keys are every day or every hour, however often they change them. Uh, but that's very cumbersome. If you have submarines at sea, uh, 
how do you get a new code book stamp? Well, you've got to have them come up and deliver to them. Obviously a difficult problem. Um, and so that was something that classified agencies like NSA and the British GCCS were trying to figure out a way to get around. Um, it's also interesting to note that several of the major espionage cases in the, uh, in the late uh, 20th century were based on basically the key distribution problem. If you remember the movie, The Falcon and the Snowman, which is actually a true story about two young guys who stole secrets from TRW in California and sold them to the Russians. Uh, it's an interesting movie. There's a lot of strange things those kids did, but uh, it's an interesting movie and it is basically a true story. A lot of what they sold were the keys for the satellite communications that the United States was using in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, probably even the 1970s. Uh, and what that meant was that the Russians, once they bought those keys, they could intercept the satellite signals, but they were encrypted. Once they could decrypt them, they knew what is base, what is called the order of battle. In, in different situations, how the US would fight, fight a battle, who would go where. They knew all of that in advance because of this stuff from the, these spies. Uh, similar thing, if you remember the Walker family spy ring in the Navy, uh, that was two brothers and then one guy's wife got involved. Uh, they were selling a lot of information to the Russians also for a lot of money. And uh, that included a lot of the keys that the Navy was using. Uh, eventually they got caught because the wife said, I can't do this anymore. And she turned her, in. She turned her husband and her brother-in-law in. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of other historic, interesting espionage stories that are based on key distribution problems. Uh, one other interesting place where the key distribution problem was kind of saw, was uh, a, a, the bane to the, the Nazis was uh, for Enigma. Uh, they distributed code books. The new codes, uh, a book came out once a month <clears throat> and the codes changed once a day. And the allies figured out that if they could get onto a submarine before, as it was sinking and get those code books out without the Germans realizing that the code book had been sold, they will then have the next month's worth of information uh, ready to go. They can decrypt it right away. And actually it was a couple of months because the, the code books came out uh, a month before they were needed so they could distribute them easily. Uh, so there were a lot of cases where there were specific attacks on these code books. So obviously the key distribution problem was made, was important. Okay, what do you do about that? Um, a technique that was basically initially done by Diffie, Hellman and Merkel in 1976 says, what if we have two different keys, one for encryption and one for decryption? Now, obviously they can't be random. They have to be connected in some way. But if you have a pair of numbers that are somehow related in some under you know, hidden way, so that if you use one to encrypt and the other one to decrypt, uh, what you can do basically is say, I can give, I can just send you the, the encryption key and you use it and you can encrypt it. And I can send you that, it can be public. That's why they call it the public key. Uh, and then you can use that and uh, encrypt the message, send it to me. And I can decrypt it, but you, but nobody else can because I have the private key. Uh, so that became the uh, the important thing. Uh, public key cryptography it was first done or published by Diffie, Hellman, and Merkel in a paper in 1976. I think it was called something like "New Directions in Cryptography" or "New Concepts in Cryptography." I'm sure you can find it very easily on the web. Uh, NSA claimed to have developed something very similar ten years earlier which they probably did because they were much more interested in it than Diffie-Hellman than, than, than Diffie and Merkel were. Uh, and GCCS, which is the British version of NSA, uh, they draw, evolved from Fletchley Park, uh, apparently did it even earlier. If you, there's a book that I will, in the references, uh, just called Crypto, back in the days when crypto meant cryptography as opposed to blockchain, block uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, that has a very thorough history of how they, how Diffie, Hellman, and Merkel did this and developed it, and et cetera. Uh, there's also some of that in the, the pre previous book uh, by Singh. Okay, so uh, where was I? Okay, so we had NSA, GCCS did it even earlier. Uh, in one of these books is an interview with the British cryptographer who supposedly developed it 
who was asked whether the, the Brits really had developed a public key cryptography. He couldn't, he didn't say yes, but he said, even if we had, you guys did a lot more with it than we would have. So it's an interesting little historic tidbit. Uh, and uh, RSA, Rivest Shamir and Edelman uh, published an, a, an algorithm and a whole system built around it that was patented in, oh, was, the algorithm was 78, the system was 83, uh, that used a much stronger mathematical algorithm. Uh, and that is what you use today, uh, virtually all the time. We use RSA or a version of RSA. Whenever you get the lock button on your browser, in the background, there has been a key exchange based on public key cryptography that enabled that link to be encrypted. Okay, so some examples of public key cryptography just in terms of what they were. The initial uh, publication was uh, Diffie-Hellman uh, key exchange. Hellman, by the way, Martin Hellman was an NYU Uptown graduate in 1966. So good to know that NYU was involved with or developed people that uh, did things like this, because that's one of the most important breakthroughs. In the, this, this is where the idea of public key cryptography was first published. RSA would just did a better version of it. Uh, then Diffie-Hellman and Merkel did a, 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 something that was closer to a full system using something called the, the knapsack, pro, pro, knapsack problem. Uh, Merkel, by the way, was Hellman's graduate student. And so, and Merkel is sort of a grandchild of NYU. Uh, RSA is still the, the uh, best known one that's based on prime factorization. There's PGP, uh, which you might've seen that's publicly available for free. And elect elliptic curve algorithms now used by NSA for public key compaction. And uh, here's a picture of uh, between uh, Hellman, Diffie, and Merkel. Merkel, Hellman, and Diffie. This one is back when they were doing this back in the 70s or early 80s, and these are more recent photos. Uh, Hellman uh, was given some kind of an award by NYU, I think a presidential medal from NYU because of his contributions. And I, I should get pictures of uh, RSA in here, but I haven't had time to do that. So you, you can find them on the web very easily. Okay. How am I doing time-wise? Uh, okay, I'm gonna have to move a little bit faster. Okay, so I've already mentioned there's the two keys. Diffie Hellman's, uh, Diffie's idea was the, uh, his idea was I can tell the world about the public key and use the private key myself to decrypt things. And I've already talked through uh, how you can communicate with others. And I mentioned those two books. Um, Okay, there's another neat thing about public key cryptography. Uh, there's a symmetric aspect to it. With public key algorithms, you can encrypt, you can encrypt your own file and post it, okay? Uh, with your, you, you can encrypt it with your, your, uh, your private key, and then people with, can use their public key to look at it and know that because it's encrypted with your private key, that it was really from you and that it hasn't been changed because you encrypted it with the, so that, that's a very important thing that it's used for. Uh, so the idea, well, I, again, I, I, I will try to distribute the slides because I don't have time to read all of these. Um, the public key cryptography is always based on a mathematical function that's easy to compute in one direction, but hard to reverse. The best example of that, which is the one RSA used, is, multiple, is factoring prime numbers. Look, um, or fi factory numbers into primes rather. Multiplying large prime numbers is very easy. You can multiply five times seven, you can multiply P times Q equals 143, um, multiply numbers, that's very easy to do. But if you don't know what P and Q were, how do you get back to it? So 35, you can very easily see, see and you have, by the way, this is always factoring into primes, two primes. Um, uh, you can probably see right away what, what 30, what uh, that five and seven come from 35. 143, you can probably figure out in a couple of minutes, it turns out to be 13 and 11. But if I give you this large number, uh, what a P and Q, how long will it take you to get that? You'll have to try dividing by basically all the prime numbers up to the square root of 11,859, et cetera, 11, uh, 11 million. Uh, so that's gonna take a long time. And if you pick, 
um, something that's a product of two primes that are hundreds of digits long, it becomes virtually an impossible problem for someone to solve. And that's the problem that RSA did use. Diffie-Hellman used something called discrete logarithms for the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and that works fine. Um, and elliptic curve, blah, blah, okay, we'll skip that. Uh, but that's the answer to that factorization, if you care about it. Okay, um, I'm reading quickly to see what I can skip over. <clears throat> um, okay, just the important point here is that public key encryption is very comp computational intensive. Okay. Uh, the important thing, with, another important thing from the user perspective is that basically you have to protect the key. If someone steals it, they can steal all your Bitcoin. Uh, so you have to make sure it's well protected. And you also have to make sure you don't lose it as in the case I mentioned before. So key security is very important. If you do wind up in a case where you're doing public key encryption, you have to make sure that you have the, your key, your private key in, a in the hands of a trusted third party. Uh, maybe it's just you have it in a bank safe deposit box, but you have to have it separate in case you lose it. Uh, and you also have to be careful, again, not, not to uh, lose it, but or not, not to let somebody steal it. Uh, the safest way to think is something called escrow, where you, you split the key into two or three different parts and different secure entities hold the different parts. And if you have three of them, then as long as you have any two, if, if you lose one of them, you can actually reconstruct the key. Um, okay, it's also used for authenticating websites and users. We won't go through that now. Um, I do want to emphasize secure cryptographic hash, sometimes called a mes message digest, digest or fingerprint of a file. Basically, the idea is you do something that's similar to encryption to a file, but along the way, you cut it down to a smaller size. And typically in blockchain, that size is 50, uh, 256 bits. So what you can do is you can take any block with this algorithm, as, as big, however big it is, and you run it through the arithmetic and you wind up with a 256-bit so-called fingerprint or message digest or hash of that file. Um, and the hash is very important. That becomes the key to uh, public the um, blockchain. So, um, and there's also digital signature, which is quite, and again, I'm gonna to have to skip some of the details. Okay, so let's go back to how the um, blockchain work. These are the basic properties. I'll go through them one at a time. It's distributed because in multiple nodes, each node has the full history and user accounts hold assets and submit transactions with timestamps to a node, et cetera. So everything happens distributed because the, the transactions wind up getting shared among all of the nodes. Um, Identities on blockchains can be anonymous as is for bit, Bitcoin, or it might be list, linked to a real person. For instance, US banking applications, you always have to have a real person with a social security number, et cetera. When you do this, the users and the nodes in blockchain are typically uh, authenticated via passwords, two-factor authentication, and public key methods. The encryption is all encrypted, uh, the communication is all encrypted typically with a session key generated during authentication when it was using public key encryption. Um, the centralized versus centralized control. This is a very important place where things differentiated from the uh, blockchain, the original blockchain. Uh, the original blockchain, there was no central control at all. It was basically all in the software. The control was in the software, particularly in the uh, consensus protocols, how you take all the, the transactions in, the prior, bro, the prior block, et cetera, combine that and get a new block. That's, that's where the control is and it's all in the hands of the software. So again, you have to trust the software, but that's the whole idea of uh, blockchains for cryptocurrencies. Um, so there's the central, that's, the, that's the decentralized. The centralized blockchains have some kind of a, a controlling authority. It could be a company, a government agency, a bank, or a controlling consortium. So you might have a lot of banks that want to work together and share data. They, they can have a consortium and they can have their own rules as to how that's controlled. It's not controlled by uh, you know, all the users, essentially, as it is in, uh, on, on cryptocurrencies. 
Okay, so we had full tolerance. Uh, uh, let me go back. Uh, I've got some stuff on the top of my screen that I can't get, get rid of, so I can't read right around this, this, this topic. Uh, basically, there's a cryptographic hash that we talked about, it includes uh, the transaction, the time timestamp, and the prior block hash. So when I have one block and I want to go to the next one, I'm going to build a hash that has the hash of the old block, the uh, timestamp, the transactions, uh, and and any other information, I, and I create a new hash out of that. Okay, that's uh, the the thing I just mentioned before. Uh, this doing the hash has been compared to putting fruit in a blender and running it a long time and taking a spoonful out. That spoonful should probably have a little bit of every single piece of fruit you put in there, uh, but you can't reconstruct the fruit from that. But if I give you um, a mixture, a different mixture of fruit, uh, you'll get you'll be able to sample the, the what comes out of the blender and see if they're different. Okay. And the Bitcoin chain uses the two, SHA-256 hash, as do many other applications. And the key thing about the hash, which I think I've mentioned this before, all bits affect the hash value. Small changes, even one bit in the block, make a large change in the hash. So if you change the bit at the, the high, high number, the high digit of your bank account, meaning you're, you're giving yourself a lot more money, that would be caught. Uh, but the block can't be recovered from the hash and it can be verified by anyone who can read the block. There's uh, a verification process that they can do. Uh, it's nearly computationally possible to make the desired changes, e.g. change a block without changing the hash. Uh, the previous accepted hash, MD5, did, did have a flow where they wait, there were ways you could make some changes and it wouldn't change the hash, and therefore that is no longer used. Um, and again, this sort of repeats some of the same things I said. I'll, I'll go through it more when I show a picture. Uh, so we just get to the picture soon. Um, okay, so this is all part of the consensus protocol. Uh, at the end of that, each no, node gets, not node, not not, gets a copy of the new block. Okay, so this is the diagram I used before, and it's basically the same thing, except that now what's going on is uh, in this consensus protocol, uh, the nodes, uh, there's another picture that'll describe this better, but basically it's everybody contributes to the consensus protocol and everybody gets the same thing out of it. Uh, now, how do the consensus protocols work? This is where there's a big difference. Uh, blockchain uses something, or the, excuse me, Bitcoin and the Bitcoin blockchain uses something called proof of work for uh, consensus. Uh, it's a complex process, but I'm not gonna go into the details on it. But basically the idea is that when there is a new block to be created, uh, any, any entity that's any node that's on the blockchain can say, I'm gonna go after this. And they're gonna take the old block uh, information, the uh, fingerprint, the timestamp, all, all that stuff, and the transaction, and create what they think is the new one and then uh, get the hash for it. The trick is they don't just get the hash by itself. There's a more complex thing where they've got to get the hash of that stuff mixed with something called the nonce, which is a random 32-bit number, and then has to meet certain requirements. And in order to do that, they have to keep guessing at what the nonce is. So they, they keep guessing, 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 and see if they get to the right answer. Meanwhile, the other nodes are doing the same thing. So this can take a while and the, the Bitcoin algorithm is, is tuned regularly so that it takes about 10 minutes to do this process. So obviously you can't do a lot of uh, fast uh, transactions. Okay, and what happens then is the winner is paid with uh, 6.25, uh, six, I think six and a half or six and a quarter Bitcoins. <clears throat> Again, this is, um, uh, money that is just created new, new Bitcoins are created just to do this, uh, but that devalues the, bit, the value of Bitcoin. Uh, that is very computer intensive and therefore very energy intensive. Proof of stake is another one that's being used by some cryptocurrencies, 
basically the idea of the validated block is based on the vote among uh, the validating nodes, which might or might not be all of them, weighted by a percentage of total network value that, of each validator. So it's really just voting based on how much money you have. And that uh, Ethereum is actually shifting to that soon. Both of these can be subject to 51% attacks. If some entity can temporarily control 51% of the network's compute power or network value, they can change any, they can approve any node they want to. So there's a, there's a risk in that. Uh, but the idea is you know, there's so much uh, compute power in the blockchain Bitcoin that it would, uh, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain, that it would be almost impossible to get that much computer power in, in working in order to take over. Um, and for the if centralized control, then whatever the organization that sets up the centralized control, whether it be a bank, a consortium of banks, a government, they decide what the protocol can be. And it can be something kind of a voter thing. And uh, sometimes voting things don't come to a conclusion right away. So something called Byzantine full tolerance that will be used. Uh, we're not going to bother going into that. Um, okay, the energy consumption. This is the thing you hear a lot about. Uh, blockchain uses a lot of energy, huge amounts of energy. Uh, it's actually the miners that use a lot of energy on some blockchains. Um, just having all the replicated nodes of the different blockchains, uh, different chains, that uses, you know, if there's n, n nodes, there's going to be n times as much energy if you did it by itself, plus a little more for overhead. But uh, the real problem is the mining using proof of work consensus. <clears throat> And I just described a little bit of what that is. <clears throat> and the fact that you can get 6.25 Bitcoins in order, if you solve the problem, uh, means that people really want to go after it and they will spend huge amounts of money to go after it because 6.25 uh, Bitcoins is now about 120 to $150,000. So they put a lot of money into racks of custom high performance chips. And in fact, for a while they were using uh, video chips because they could do a lot more computation because of all the parallel things in the video processing chips. They try to put it near sources of very cheap power. In Iceland, they used to go there for the geothermal power, which was very cheap. They've been thrown out of Iceland. They were doing it in Quebec. I think they've been thrown out of Quebec now because of the very cheap hydropower there. They were doing it in China. I think China's tried to throw them out. But they still spend a lot of money and use tremendous amount of energy. Uh, to give you an idea of how much energy, there's a recent report that estimated that the Bitcoin blockchain alone uses 150 terawatts, not kilowatts, megawatts, gigawatts, but terawatts per year, uh, terawatt hours rather, more than eight Argentina. So the whole country of Argentina uses less power than the, the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. Uh, the Ethereum blockchain uses 45 million terawatts, which is about the size of what, what the whole nation of Switzerland uses right now. Ethereum is using is moving to a proof of stake consensus protocol, which they claim will use 99% less power. So when you hear complaints about the cost of the, the energy effects of using blockchain, it's really only in certain blockchains, the ones that use proof of uh, work algorithms. Okay, we'll skip this. Um, distributed. Uh, uh, this is one more view of how it works now because it's there's got the parallel things going on. Uh, okay, so the same pictures before, but now I put this dot dot dot. I mean, there's a whole string of things and that are doing the same thing. Uh, and there's a you know there's another stream here where they go from one to the one to the one. There's a similar set behind there. So the transactions from multiple places go to the consensus pro process. The prior node goes there. The hash for the prior node goes there, the timestamp goes there, and any other information you need to include, uh, that goes there. Consensus process then comes up with what the new block should look like, including what the state of the ledger, uh, the, the new time will actually be added to it. Uh, you keep the transaction here because getting from here to here is based on the transaction. So this uh, has to be all together. It's got the hash, et cetera. Uh, so I talked to this diagram once before, and you can see it as it goes along, uh, we're using this secure hash now, a cryptographic hash, so that if you change something in here, it's in this 
hash. This hash is part of what's in here. So it will show up here with a change. It'll show up here, et cetera. So you can change things, essentially. Um, okay, permissions is another main uh, difference between the block, the crypt, the blockchain for um, Bitcoin and others. Uh, there's three flavors, uh, permissionless blockchain, uh, blockchains, which is what Bitcoin uses and other cryptocurrencies typically use. Uh, public permission blockchains uh, and private permission blockchains. There's the different levels of control, basically. Um, permissionless allows anyone to join the system as a user, submit transactions, read all the blocks, the block data in the blocks, potentially become a node themselves. Uh, they can verify anything because all the data that's in the, in the blockchain is, is open for them to see, et cetera. This is what Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies use. Uh, users can be anonymous. Um, and as we saw before, the FBI doesn't want you to be anonymous in a lot of cases, and they might be able to find you, and they might not. Okay, public permission blockchains are very similar, uh, but they restrict who can join and what they can do. So if it was, let's say, some kind of a government application, they would say only people government in this department or this division can do things. Uh, if it's a banking thing, maybe only the bank customers could, can, can join in. Uh, but in the case of a public permission blockchain, the public can see all the transactions. Now, in most commercial applications, you don't want that. But they can be useful if you're doing some government applications where you want to have transparency of just what is going on, where you can allow the public to actually see all the transactions, you could see the books, you could see where everything is coming from, where all, it's all going, uh, but only let certain entities make transactions in the system. Uh, and that's usually centrally controlled, but that's, I don't know of any applications now that are actually doing that for transparency purposes, but in the future, that could be a very useful application. The last uh, permissioned, uh, private permission, private permission blockchains, uh, they restrict who can join and what they can what they can see and what they can do. This has to be centrally controlled. Uh, for example, a banking system would include account holders, auditors, and employees as users. There'd be others too, but account holders have permission to see their own account and submit submit transactions for their account. Auditors would be able to see all the data but not change anything because their job is to audit. So they get to see everything, make sure everything's going nicely, and they, by the way, would be very happy with the uh, the, the crypto hashes that, that really say, say the things haven't changed and they can just verify that things haven't changed. Uh, employees would have a different permissions based on their job. There might be some that can you know, change, change values, whatever. Uh, but the, the, at the bank would discern, determine what those permissions are for different groups. The same as they would do now just for an ordinary system. Again, all the things that you can do with blockchain, you can do without blockchain. Uh, blockchain just adds a degree of, uh, Immutability is the most important thing for commercial applications. Okay. And here's a, a table uh, that compares a number of things of a traditional database and the three kinds of blockchains. I mentioned the public permission list, which is what block, uh, Bitcoin uses. Uh, public permission, this is the one that would be good for uh, government applications and private permissions. This might be banks, companies, et cetera. Uh, Software maturity is an interesting thing. This shows how, how safe you can feel with the software. Uh, you can see the differences there. This has been around a long time. This is a, a new, newest one. Transaction speed is probably the most important thing in most cases uh, for commercial applications. Traditional database, this is, I don't know what particular kind of application, they, maybe it's a banking application, but they can do 100,000, uh, excuse me, 100 million uh, transactions per second. That sounds like a high number. Uh, the Bitcoin one is very slow, 10 seconds, uh, 10 per second, 10 transactions per second. Uh, the other two permissioned one will be faster because they, they don't have to do things like use the uh, proof of work thing for consensus. And this says computational resources, um, whether you can do secure data, well, on a traditional database, you can because you control it all. On the public ones, you can't because it's available to everybody. Uh, and on private permissioned ones, 
you can, but you, you control which ones are private, which ones aren't. Immutable, that's the big problem with the traditional database. All the others are immutable with constraints and footnotes. And public attack for surface, this refers to how easy it is to attack. I have to give credit to the authors of this table. It comes from a small company called uh, Trail of Bits. It's a small security company. Um, and they published this in 2002. I'm going to reference a couple of their articles with the references. Uh, but the NYU connection here is that Trail of Bits was, was co-founded by Dan Guido, who was a graduate of NYU uh, in or formerly, I guess it was Brook Polytechnic University when he joined. I'm not sure what it was when he graduated in the early 2000s. And he founded this, co-founded this company. Uh, and they have a center of excellence for blockchain technology. So they are good people to talk to if you want to do blockchain. But again, there's the NYU connection here again. So we've got uh, Merkel, um, Hellman, and, and Guido. Okay, they can still be hacked. And I've already mentioned some of these things before, so I won't repeat them again. I will distribute the slides. Um, and the one other new thing that hasn't mentioned that is really very useful and uh, should be really mentioned more, but there wasn't time to go into it, something called smart contracts. You can build rules into the blockchain, just as you could onto any system, saying when certain, some, when certain events happen, that triggers another event. Uh, so this could be used, for example, if you have a supply chain application, a transaction uh, uh, indicating that a receipt of a component from the supplier can automatically generate a transaction for, to pay it. So you don't have to worry about somebody in receiving, getting the package, figuring out where it goes, blah, 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 and then send, sending you know message to somebody else, to somebody else, somebody else to send a checkout. This can all be automated. Once somebody says, looks at the, the loading, says, okay, this is here, click that it's here, the check will go out right away. And that's one of the really useful things because it's all automated and it's secure and they, it's very traceable. We can put compliance requirements into the logic using uh, smart contracts. So that's a very useful thing for the, for the future, particularly. And so to think about if you're looking to develop some kind of a blockchain application. Just a touch of history. Uh, I mentioned earlier that David Chom's 1982 doctoral dissertation had a lot of the features of uh, what we now call block blockchain. Computer systems established, maintained, and trusted by mutually suspicious groups. And that was a vault system, which is somewhat like blockchain. And there's a much more thorough look at the history of all the things that wind up in blockchain and the other, this other paper by Sherman, et cetera. I won't skip those. Okay, applications. Um, a lot of people are talking about doing applications. IBM reported that 91% of banks are investing in blockchain solutions. 66% expect to be in production uh, running at scale, but nobody says when they're gonna be in scale. I don't, I, there's not a lot that are running really at scale yet. Maybe some of you have examples that you've worked on. Uh, many of the things that show up in the press are aspirational. They're doing baby applications, evaluating potential, internal development. So uh, there's a lot far to go before we'll really be there, but I think it eventually will be very useful and used a lot. Um, and again, there's nothing that you can't do without blockchain. It's just that you have certain security and particularly immutability features of it. Uh, which you could somehow in include in other applications, but or other methods of developing applications. Uh, but you really have to look closely before uh, you do this and why you're doing it. Is you're doing it for cost savings, for security, for mutability, and understand that before you start a project. Um, okay, IBM Blockchain for Business has a large effort in blockchain. <clears throat> they have lots of examples there that you could look at. They work with you to develop your applications, you know, that, they want you as a customer to run their stuff on their systems or on systems they manage. Um, and they're developing generic platforms for application areas like supply chain. Uh, there's one for medical record. So they already have a basis and you, you don't go in and build things from scratch. You can just go to IBM or other vendors that I'll mention in a minute and say, okay, you've got the infrastructure there. I just have to figure out how to make my application work on your on infrastructure. Uh, one that is working is, uh, uh, 
trade lens, which is for global container shipping with Maersk. And IBM supports Hyperledger, which is a, a Linux Hyperledger, which is an open source uh, blockchain sort basis. Uh, and they contributed much of the software to that. So uh, uh, here are the other platforms. You can just use Hyperledger directly yourself. <clears throat> uh, that's from the Linux Foundation. It's open software. Microsoft does similar things to IBM. They call it the Azure Blockchain Service. And Amazon AW has something called a blockchain on AWS. You can go to any of these sites and you can see what they have and how they can help you develop an application on top of their existing blockchain infrastructure. And the key things, and this is getting really late. Uh, okay, the key things that you have to look at uh, is <clears throat> when you're trying to do it, do you want it decentralized or centralized? In most cases, commercial application will be centralized. Who owns and controls the nodes? Again, if it's centralized, you have control over that. What are the contents of the ledger? That's just normal system design. Permissionless or permissioned? I think in almost all cases for commercial things, you're going to want it permissioned. Class of users, who they are. And you probably have different class of users and they'll have different permissions. Again, this is all standard system development questions. Um, but they impact how you will do a blockchain deployment. Consensus protocol, uh, that can be tricky uh, because it's not as many well-established alternatives unless you're doing something like a cryptocurrency you're not going to want to use something like proof of work it's hugely expensive to do uh, and you don't get much for it uh, but there they could be just simple simple control by one company or a consortium company etc and another thing to consider is the cost for transition uh, from legacy databases and apps <clears throat> it might only make sense for new apps you're going to develop develop the new ones on uh, blockchain. You still have to worry about interface with the old systems, though. Uh, there's nothing. Potential issues would be regulatory and environment, particularly banks and financial companies, international laws. There's privacy laws that are different in the, in the EU than the US. So if you are, particularly with regard to personal information, names, email addresses, addresses, social security, et cetera, in Europe, there are very strict rules on <clears throat> where that can be stored. If you have a blockchain where you've got, let's say 30 different chains in different countries, they can't be identical because the ones that have the, U, the data for the EU people cannot be located outside the EU. So you have to look closely to things like that. There's also tax laws and cross-border payments you probably have to do something with. <clears throat> Scalability is always an issue with, with blockchain, certainly for things like Bitcoin and the the, the very the much slower things, that's gonna be an issue. You have to figure out what you're really gonna be doing and how it's, how it's gonna perform. And I've already mentioned that you can go to IBM, Accenture, um, Microsoft, X. I think that's supposed to be Amazon, not Accenture, but maybe Accenture has it too. I shouldn't double check that. Uh, okay, some potential areas. I'm just, I probably wind up skipping all of these, but in the slides there's you know, banking application. These are not things that exist, but things that you might think about and how, what they would do, supply chain, airline maintenance, <clears throat> voting. I will say that people have been talking about doing internet voting for literally decades, uh, doing voting on blockchain uh, for at least seven or eight years, maybe longer. Um, and people say, oh, it's secure. It's, you know, it's uh, immutable. People can't change. It sounds wonderful. The problem is it introduced so many other problems that uh, an analysis by Ron Rivest, the RNRSA, and others at MIT, basically in done in 2000, uh, I think they did the work actually before the election in 2000, uh, basically said it's a terrible idea, worse than internet voting, which in general security people think is a, a terrible idea. Uh, one other existing example that's recent is one that was done on IBM, NYS Excel Excelsior vaccination pass which is used to store your COVID vaccination and test results, that's done on a blockchain platform. I'm not sure how much they needed blockchain. Uh, it might have just been a way of showing off blockchain because they probably did it for free for New York State or something like that. But uh, they did that. And you, can, you don't have to have a smartphone to get at the data. You can print off something with a QR code that will do the same thing. Uh, a food program. Uh, in, in a refugee camp, basically 
they let the refugees have um, some ID card uh, with a biometric, biometric uh, security on that let them go around and uh, buy food from different places within the refugee camp. And it was limited to what they was sort of like having a credit card, but they didn't have to pay the credit card fees, which amazingly were $150,000 per year before they did this. So that sounds like it was worthwhile. Uh, NFTs, you probably have enough about that in the news. Uh, one good quote about NFTs from a year and a half ago uh, from the New York Times article is, it's just a pent up cycle where the money has nowhere to go. So it's doing stupid things. That's sort of my opinion, but maybe you think differently. Uh, Concluding remarks, um, a lot of potential is about foundation for more reliable, mutable, verifiable distributed systems. I think in time it will be widely deployed. Uh, they, can, uh, they can sort of run faster, but uh, save middlemen, but there's other things that slow them down, at least with current te technology. Um, there's a lot of projects to create new systems or migrating system systems to run on top of blockchain but there's only a small number of actually deployed systems that are running at scale. There's a lot of sample projects, but not a lot running at scale. And the high cost to migrate will be, or the, the cost of time and effort to migrate will be high for a while until there's a lot more experience. There aren't many people that are trained in it to help you, even if you go to IBM or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> these are the references. I will <clears throat> distribute that. I will mention two papers from Trail of Bits. Uh, one is called, do you really need a blockchain, uh, which summarizes a lot about the different types of blockchains and then goes to the kind of questions you should ask, it, do you really wanna do this in blockchain? And maybe you do, maybe you don't. They also have a whole section on about, if you do it in blockchain, what kind of new issues you have to secure that system? And there's a second paper, um, unintended centralities and distributed lectures. This is a, really a warning that if you think that uh, you're, not sent, you're not doing a central system, it turns out that you really are. Um, the first one is the one that I found a really interesting and useful paper. And there are, there are more references here, including the books that I mentioned. Uh, so you know, the, the four platforms. Uh, and this, the, the references for the examples I talked about, these are the books. Okay. so. Uh, I know that took a little longer than I planned to, and I was rushing a bit at the end, but there's still, and there's still a half an hour left. What I wanted to do is open up the questions. So I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions. Um, and I would also like to talk to anyone or have anyone who has experience with actually trying to set up a blockchain application to just say a few words about what they're trying to do, uh, what their experience is, and any particular issues they found. So what I would like to do is... Um, have people raise their hands and Alexandra will pick people at random uh, to ask the question or talk about some application they're, they're, they're doing and what experience they've had with that. But I would like the application discussions to be limited to five minutes just so we don't get tied up on one application. Okay, Alexandra, up to you. Okay, so we'll open the floor to want to ask a question, feel free to raise your hand, unmute yourself. Um, you also have the option to turn your camera on as well, so make it more interactive. Okay, Ravi? Yes, uh, good evening, Professor. Uh, quick question, please. Yes. In your mind, what sets the price of a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin? Where, I... where, where's the value coming from? Uh, I personally don't see much value in crypto cryptocurrencies. Uh, Thank you. And that's why this is about, I, I said specifically, this is about blockchain, the useful technology behind Bitcoin. Understood. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Wow, I thought there'd be a lot of questions and people that are trying to develop blockchain applications. Uh, is there anything that I went through too fast? Because I know it's speeding up at the end. Bill, did you want me to look at some of the questions in the chat 
Cornish. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if there are questions in the chat, definitely look at those. I, um, okay, that's probably what people would put in their questions, not in uh, raising their hand. Mr. Mm -hmm. Lewis has his hand raised. Oh. Yeah. Um, I, I, you'll also find my question in the chat. If each new ledger or block contains a history of the previous blocks, wouldn't those files get bloated and enormous in size after a while? Okay. It doesn't have the whole previous block. It has the fingerprint of the previous block, which is 256 bits. But it has information that is loaded into there in this blender uh, that came from all the previous bits. So or any previous blocks. So as you go along, you know, that you can't construct backwards, but if you change something, even in like say the block one, and you look at block 17, there should be some small difference in the hash, actually a big difference because the, you, you change one thing by one bit and it makes big changes. That's the magic of uh, hashes. Okay, so there was a question from Raymond. Yes. Uh... My question is, because Bitcoin is open source, right? But the blockchain is open source. So I wonder if no, there no. is- Blockchain is a, is, a, is a technology. You can get open source versions of this, this blockchain infrastructure. You can get that through, um, uh, oh, what was the name of it? This, the second one I listed. That's open source. This comes from uh, the Linux Foundation. Uh, IBM actually used that. So you can, that's open source. The other ones are not actually open source. Blockchain, presume, um, Bitcoin, presumably their blockchain is open source. I mean, I never actually looked at that question, but given the way the whole system was developed, I would assume that they did it as open source. But it, there are non-open source blockchain infrastructure systems that you can build your application on. Yeah, so my question is that, does, 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 the, does, does does it make does it make it less secure less secure because it's open source? Like because it's open source, like people have access to a code. So does it make it easy? easy that debate has been going on for at least 25 years that I know of. I can remember a, a conference in on security in uh California, the annual one that the IEEE does in uh used to be in Berkeley, uh, where there was a panel discussion about that exact point. And this was 20 to 25 years ago. And there was somebody from Microsoft saying, because anybody can see it, anybody can find the flaws. And then there was there were a few other people, some of them arguing the exact opposite point saying, uh, because anybody can see it, any you know, people can find and fix the flaws. And that because we can't see what Microsoft is doing, there could be flaws that we don't know about. And why should we trust you more than this crowd of people that are really interested in, and wanna make sure things are working well? Um, so it's an old debate. Uh, I won't take a position on it. My, my personal instinct, well, I won't take my, give you my instincts, uh, but it, it is still an open question as far as I know. Uh, obviously, given the popularity of Linux, uh, a lot of people think that it actually is safer. Um, and I haven't been tracking all the, all the bug and floor reports lately, but uh, I, I suspect there's still more bugs coming out of Microsoft than uh, Linux, but I, I don't know that for sure. I know Microsoft, they were bit by bugs a lot in the 90s. They got all kinds of uh, flack from their major corporate customers that were complaining, you got, you got to clean up your security, you keep up having problems. And they, they put together a very effective software uh, development process that include all kinds of checks and balances, uh, not balances, but all kinds of checks, reviews, et cetera. Uh, but there's still bugs coming out and you get bug reports in almost any kind of software. You, know, you get the patch Tuesdays and you get other companies do it once a month. Um, um, you know, there's going to be holes in any of them. I don't know specifically about how the numbers compare for uh, Windows versus uh, Linux. Be an interesting question. Does anybody actually know that data or have an idea of what that data is? But the argument that people can find the bugs and therefore exploit them, is, it's, it's been raised for 25 years. Uh, and the other thing is, well, we don't, know how, we don't know what your code looks like. We don't know how you developed it. There's bugs there too. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Okay, I do see in the chat that someone asked about the references and we will be sending out a separate email um, after the discussion with the references. I see that Yanis asked several questions in the chat. Yanis, did you wanna ask your questions directly to Bill? Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you for a very thorough and broad and uh, profound uh, presentation. Uh, the first question I had, has to do with the um, um, verification process that everybody in the blockchain can verify a transaction. And I'm wondering if that's practically feasible. Like if you have like, let's say billion users and you have like a trillion or so of transactions, can practically these be verified simultaneously? And would that be like also energetically very, uh very costly to do that for every transaction well first of all the transactions are not handled one at a time they they collect a whole bunch they do a, a whole bunch of transactions at one time and the verification doesn't have to be done by the use they they can but the verification is is, is done as part of the consensus process um so I don't know that you would have 3 billion people all trying to do the verification at the same time. Um, the verification, by the way, is not nearly as expensive as proof of work. It, it basically um, it involves one hash. You, you take the data and, and do, the, do the SHA-256 hash and see what comes out of it, and it should match what is shown on the web. And I don't know the details, but presumably, the any any reasonable consensus protocol or consensus process would be checking all of the um, hashes that, that that they have you know at least for those two blocks maybe going back a few blocks i i don't know what's built in to the bitcoin blockchain uh presumably you have some control if you're developing your own applications to how that protocol works and, you know, and, and can that be hacked can somebody like fake the verification of a transaction and then pretend it's verified when actually, you know, he did all the verification himself? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. I mean, the verification is something that you, 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 you can run the, the data on the block through the uh, hashing algorithm and see what comes out. How do you fake that? I mean, you, can, you might tell somebody that it, it checked, but when it really didn't, but they can run the verification themselves. So if you uh, you tell somebody that it's verified, but it's not, uh, you, you'll be caught trivially. Or is okay. there a different? Maybe that maybe I didn't understand the question properly. No, no. I th I, th I think I, th I think you you, you addressed it, but uh, provided somebody is gonna check. Um, if if you're like faking if you're faking verification, that means you're saying it was true. When it didn't really match, what purpose is that for? And who are you going to? What are you going to use that for? You're going to use that in some fraudulent way, but whoever you give that information to will be able to verify. And if they have any common sense, they will say, "Oh, really? There's a there's a there's a mismatch in the hash on the on the blockchain. Let me go look at that." But uh, but can be because this has to be signaled to the users. Like somebody has to signal me that I have to verify something, right? Can that signal no, no. process be you compromised? Don't have, you don't have to verify anything. What happens is the the verification is matching the hash against the, the block before it, et cetera, that, that kind of thing. And that should be part of the 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 consensus agreement that gives you the what the next block is. So you would only actually have to go in and verify if you thought that the consensus agreement wasn't working uh, or something was wrong with that. It's, it, it's, you don't have to verify it at all. It, the, the presumption would be that the, the block that's there is correct. And it could, because that, that, that block that is there, that, that SHA-256 uh, hash uh, was created by the consensus algorithm. Uh, that wasn't somebody else just put something in there. It, it is developed by the consensus algorithm. OK, 
Okay, did you have another one? So it looks like we've addressed all of the questions in the chat. If we don't have any other people on the line that wanted to ask a bill a question, we can move on to the next segment. Well, actually, this, this was the final segment. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who is actually involved with or has been involved with trying to develop an application, even a baby application on blockchain? Maybe you can you know, tell us a little bit what, you, what you've done and you know, what, what decisions you made about control, uh, decentralized versus centralized permissions and things like that, issues you found, uh, found you ran into, or even things you wanted to discuss, how should I do this? I mean, that, that I'm, I haven't really, like, you know, I'm not really a developer, so, uh, but I could at least talk through some of the issues about the, the options that you have. So I have to assume that there's nobody from the banking industry here because uh, the IBM reports that said like 91% of the, the banks, major banks were looking at blockchain applications. Okay. Um, I guess we're probably close to the, uh, I don't know, we, have, we have a few more minutes if anyone has more questions, if not, um, we can just stop it here. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your presentation, Bill. This concludes the masterclass series. And thank you very much for joining us. Um, tomorrow we have uh, technical animations by Blender that will be launched from 6 to 8 p.m. So if you haven't signed up for that yet, there's still time. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank all those of you who joined in and uh, listened and from the questions, paid attention. And I hope you do take something out of this, maybe for your job or maybe just for your self-interest. And when you read articles about blockchain, you'll understand that you don't know what they mean when they say, just say blockchain. They've got to say more about it. It's, uh, there's a lot of variables in developing blockchain applications. Okay, so thank you and good night.